Hi. Well, so far we've really had a focus on harmony, which is no big surprise because the clue's in the title, isn't it? This is a keyboard harmony course, so we want to be really sure about our harmony. But we don't want to think about harmony to the exclusion of everything else. So I'm going to start the third part of this course by thinking about melodic design and other things that are associated with that. So it may be that a particular keyboard harmony challenge you need to go about is this one, where instead of starting with a melody that we're trying to find chords to fit, actually we're starting with a, a set of chords, what we call a chord scheme, and we're trying to find a melody that fits with the chords. So let's have a think about this one. I've purposely kept these chords fairly straightforward. We're in the key of C major. Let's just see if we can find all the chords we need. So we've got one, and then we're going to five, then we're coming back to one, and then we're going to four, and then to five, and then back to one again. So the first thing is just to get familiar with that sequence of chords. Uh, you may already be highly familiar with that kind of sequence of chords, that's fine. If you're not and you want to pause and just get your fingers around it, that would be a great thing to do. The next thing is to be able to play those basic triads as I've just done it, but really thinking about where it all fits rhythmically. Because you can see that in bars one and three, we've got two chords to the bar. In bars two and four, we've just got one chord to the bar. So we want to make sure that we can keep these four beats going in every bar. One thing that often happens with keyboard harmony ventures is that it says that it's got four beats in a bar or someone's decided it's going to have four beats in a bar, but in fact we get four beats in some bars, three in another, five in another, four and a half in another, and it's becoming dislocated rhythmically just because we haven't actually got the right number of beats in every bar. It's easy to think from one chord to the next or one melody note to the next without really keeping tabs on where we are in the bar. So one thing that it will be useful to do now is to think, can we play this chord scheme but keeping it exactly in time? So this is on the first beat, this is on the third beat. This is taking all four beats, that's on the first beat, that's on the third beat, that's taking all four beats. So can we do that? So we go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That in itself is harder to do than most people realize. If you're just gonna doodle about until you can work out where the next chord is, you'll be adding beats right, left and center. So getting used to timing that in relation to whatever the time signature may be. So that's something else that you might just want to stop and practice so you can move through the chord scheme, but to keep it in time. Okay, now then, how are we going to set about improvising some kind of melody that fits with that chord scheme? And the thing that most people experience when they start trying to do this is they end up with notes in the melody clashing with the chords and not sounding terribly satisfactory. The problem being that they've got notes in the melody that don't actually belong to the chords. So the thing we're going to do first is to try and improvise a melody that just uses notes that belong to the triad. So when we're playing chord one, the melody at the moment is only going to use the notes C, E and G. When we're using chord five, the melody is only going to use the notes G, B, D. When we're playing chord four, the melody is only going to use the notes F, A, C. So you might sort of think, okay, yeah, well, I suppose I could do something like this. That's fine as a starting point because you're using the notes of the triad and getting used to slipping those into a melody. You're also already discovering something that if you want to use all the notes of the triad and you've got to fit it into the time available, sometimes you've got to have rhythm in the melody that's going faster than the chord changes, the harmonic rhythm. So it's a good exercise in 
trying to do that and not just to do a note and the melody that moves every time there's a chord because we could do what I've just asked you to do using the same rhythm by doing this. So that's okay, isn't it? It all sounds all right. The melody belongs to the chords, but it's pretty boring, isn't it? Because the melody is just following the rhythm of the chord. So we're trying to do something that's got a little bit of rhythmic independence, as well as finding melody notes that would work to float above the chords. So this takes a little bit of doing. Now, to make it a bit more interesting, you don't just have to start at the bottom of the triad and climb up the next two notes of the triad. You could take the triad in any order you wanted to do. So we could do something like this, still keeping the triads kind of as they are on the left hand. Okay, not the world's most exciting melody, but rather more interesting than just going up the triad or just coming down the triad. I'm trying to duck and dive inside the triads. And I'm also thinking about when we go from one melody note to the next, does the melody have a particular pull? Like for example, at the beginning, if you go C and E over that initial chord one, you maybe come down to D next because the D is in between the C and the E. So it's going to sound a bit more melodic than just leaping all over the place. And what we want to try and do is get a little bit of balance between what we call conjunct and disjunct movement. So conjunct is just notes that are next door to each other and disjunct is when we're leaping. When you're just using notes that belong to the chords, the tendency is to sort of leap all over the landscape. I mean, you could do it like this, couldn't you, for example? But you see, that doesn't make much sense as a melody, does it? Because we're jumping all over the landscape. So that's a kind of extreme example of dealing with this in a disjunct kind of way. So it's making sure the leaps aren't too big, but just thinking, where does the melody lead me? As I'm listening to that melody, do I sort of hear the next note? And that's to do with this thing we call voice leading. Where does the melody really want to go? Where is it pulling us? So if you can kind of follow your instincts with that, often a melody does want to go in a particular direction, but and often a melody doesn't pull in any particular direction. So you're thinking, well, it could be this or it could be that, but it's probably not going to be something else. So use your ears to sort of think, where's, where's this actually taking me? So you can pause at any point, And this is another point where you might want to pause just to think, okay, let's see if I can deliver the chord scheme, keeping the pulse steady, keeping four beats in every bar, moving the chords in the right place, and then improvise a melody in the right hand that's using notes that just belong to the triad in question, but is making some kind of melodic sense. So there's a kind of melodic flow, a melodic shape to it that actually is musically intelligible. Okay, so if you want to pause and do that, feel free or stick with this and uh, see it through to the end if you want to. What we're now going to do is to move on and say, okay, well, we can't just live on a melody line that's just using notes that belong to the chords. But that doesn't mean to say, well, you can just use any old notes you like because then that's where we get into trouble, isn't it? Um, what we can do though, is to make use of something we've already talked about, the inessential notes. So if we slip a few passing notes in, if we slip a few auxiliary notes in, if we maybe use the odd anticipatory note, we can get more of a flow into the melody and these inessential notes will open up extra opportunities for us to use conjunct movement. So for example, you know, if I on the, in the first bar wanted to do this in the melody, C, E, G, well, I could connect that with passing notes, couldn't I? I could go and suddenly melodically, that's much stronger, isn't it? Now it involves us in using some quicker notes again, but do you see how that really flows on? It's 
not the only thing you can do there, but it's got a definite kind of melodic character just by running up the scale. And then when you get to the G and the chord changes, it all flows on very nicely, doesn't it? So how can we do this? Lots of different possibilities, even within this simple chord scheme, just to think passing notes, auxiliary notes, where does it take me to? Just one possibility. Okay, it all sounds a bit kind of sort of twee at the moment, doesn't it? That doesn't matter. But every note in that melody makes sense because it either belongs to the chord, so it's a harmony note or an essential note, or it's one of these inessential notes. Lots of passing notes there, some auxiliary notes going as well. So you can combine this kind of using notes from the chords with the inessential notes. You get much more flow into it you're discovering all the time about how to get the rhythm to be independent of the chord movement. And we've got much more kind of opportunity to use conjunct movement to balance any disjunct movement that we want to have. And by the way, in any melody, you don't want to be exclusively disjunct or exclusively conjunct. You want some kind of balance between the two. So, we're also now talking about how we can make the rhythm a little bit more interesting. So that kind of goes along with thinking about the melody. At the moment, we've just got the chords plonking down as triads. So the other thing that you want to think about having got this far with it is what can we do to vary the texture? What do I mean by that really? Well, texture is all about how is the sound organized? So am I just gonna sit here going triad, 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 or am I going to say, well, actually, I already know how to use those triads to make chords, but could we do something to make it a bit more interesting? Like, for example, could we turn the left hand into an Alberti bass? Something like this. You see, so there's the Alberti bass idea, just breaking up the triad, going bottom top, middle top, bottom top, middle top. You might even think, actually, if I'm going to do the Alberti bass there, I could use a few inversion chords. So maybe going from one to five B to one, because if you go one and then jump to five, then jump back to one, that doesn't go quite as smoothly as going one, five B, back to one, because then the bass goes by step from C to B to C. And arguably it's slightly easier to play actually. Um, so you might think, yeah, actually I could use a 5B there. You could use 4B, 5B, 1, so that the bass then goes A, B, C. So now we're also just thinking, you know what, apart from a melody in the right hand, there can be some little sense of a, a sort of counter melody going in the bass part. Well, that may be a step too far at the moment, I don't know, or you may be ready to embrace that, but certainly worth thinking about, are there some first inversion chords here that would just help to vary things so we're not stuck in root position all the time, we're getting um, kind of empowered in the use of first inversion chords, and at the same time we're getting a melody that's kind of making sense with harmony notes and in essential notes, we're getting a bit of independent rhythm. Um, you know, what's the sense of the line and the phrase that's going on? Or do we want to break up the chords in some other way? So we could do something that's a bit wider than just Alberti, like something like this. just a kind of extension of breaking up the chords. You see, suddenly it sounds much more like a piece of music, doesn't it, than clonking chords down. So at the end of the day, I mean, it takes time to get fluent in keyboard harmony, but you want to be playing music that doesn't sound like keyboard harmony, <laughs> but actually sounds like a real piece of music in whatever style you want to work in. And uh, we'll come back and maybe talk a bit more about styles later on. But for now, hopefully you can see that we've got quite a few things to work on. We've 
got the kind of harmony side of things moving, which is brilliant. Now maybe it's a good opportunity to do a bit of work on melodic improvisation that fits with the chord scheme, getting happy about harmony and inessential notes, thinking about how you might vary the texture as well to make the whole thing more interesting. You could even do things like put the chords in the right hand, have the melody going in the left hand, you know? Even if you're just repeating chords in the right hand for now, you know? But just to get the idea of turning the thing upside down. And when you're improvising a longer piece, those kind of variations are really welcome. Otherwise you find yourself on a loop going around the same old thing over and over again, thinking I'm not quite sure what else to do. So freeing yourself up to do things with the texture um, is really a very liberating um, exercise. It's gonna take time to get used to doing that if you've not done it before. So be ready to make an investment of time in it. And if you can do all this in C major, well, why not venture out and think, okay, what about these other keys? What about G major, F major? What about thinking about some of the minor keys we've done? A minor, E minor, D minor. Take a step further if you're feeling brave and get around the circle of fifths. It's amazing how many people can do some quite good improvisation, keyboard harmony stuff in C major, but as soon as they leave C major, they're in trouble. So we want to be able to explore the keys a bit. So quite a bit of stuff there that I've tried to set you up with that you could take away and, and really work on, and then come back for the next exciting development.